Um, I hope we will be some light lunch entertainment for you today, because <laughs> the topic is none but CBDCs, which of course is something we've been discussing for many, many years by now. I have the pleasure to welcome next to me Gilbert Verdian, who is the founder and CEO of Quant, followed by Marion Labour, senior economist at Deutsche Bank, and Josh Lipsky, senior director at the Atlantic Council Geoeconomic Center. Uh, and before we start the conversation, I'd just like to frame the conversation a little bit. In the title today, we have actually the relevance of CBDC for capital markets, which is something that arguably hasn't been discussed at great lengths for that many years. And just to remind ourselves where the whole concept of central bank digital currencies came from, in 2015, some guy called De Corning wrote a blog on saying, wouldn't it be great if we had a Fed coin? Uh, and a central banker picked it up and told everybody at the Frankfurt Central Banking Conference the next year, and central bankers got quite excited about the topic. And then, of course, we had the cryptocurrency boom, we had Libra, which everybody got a little bit scared about in terms of having a big tech suddenly issuing private money, what would that mean for monetary policy? Um, and then, of course, we had China deciding to launch its pilot, which is still ongoing with millions of people for some, maybe no longer a pilot in description. But CBDCs really divide themselves into two categories. The retail one, which is sort of what you and me use in shops to make our purchases, uh, and the wholesale discussion. And wholesale is really about central bank money exchanged between banks and financial institutions domestically, but potentially also cross-border. And interestingly enough, now we have more than 114 or around 114 CBDC projects around the world, around 60 that are more or less live. But the retail topic kept everybody quite interested over the last few years, whilst now we're seeing more and more interest in the wholesale space, which is, of course, also motivated by geopolitical uh, constraints, you know, things about, you know, if you cut off the SWIFT network, how do you uh, exchange money across borders or domestically? So there are a number of very interesting questions uh, associated with this. But our focus today is also capital markets and the big question, will there be any positive or negative impact that CBDCs will be having in that space? So I just open the floor and maybe we start with Gilbert and your background and your views on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, my, my background has been in, in regulation, uh, in, in treasury, in government, uh, as well as in banking and financial services for, for 20 years with a cyber background. Um, been looking at this space since 2008, and I think uh, as a technology, CBDCs really is a transformative way to change how the system works. Um, and it unlocks a lot of, uh, uh, I guess, legacy issues that we've had with the financial system, and we've built upon those over the years leading to friction, velocity, and a lot of barriers. So if, if we start using tokenized money and tokenized assets, we're really solving a lot of the problems that we've inherited in the financial system, in capital markets, in payments, and, and others. Excellent. Now, over to Marion. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, very glad to be there. So on my side, uh, I, I used to work in the private sector, uh, in academia, and in the public sector. And my interest in CBDC and digital assets uh, is, um, coming from uh, the Central Bank of Luxembourg. So I started there, uh, it was in 2014, and at this time, uh, Luxembourg was looking for additional way to, in terms of revenue, it was the end of the separate banking area, and they were looking at uh, crypto asset, DLT, blockchain, uh, Central Bank digital currencies, and any kind of digital assets. And it was a fascinating time, uh, given that it was the end of the separate banking area, uh, and at this time as well, they were looking at uh, Estonia. So it, it's, a, it's a small country, but very uh, tech uh, country. Given that they started developing the blockchain technology early 2000, they were looking for uh, a country which was uh, neutral to store uh, their data. So I, I started working there. And uh, then I moved uh, in academia. So I spent a few years at Harvard. Uh, and I looked at uh, digital assets, but from, from an academic perspective. And now uh, I'm currently sitting in the Deutsche Bank research team and I'm looking at uh, digital assets. Uh, so not only cryptocurrency, but uh, also central bank digital currencies. And just my personal view to answer the second part of your question. Uh, if, so I, I would say that much more has been published in, uh, in terms of retail CBDC. And if I look at uh, mainly retail, 
uh, the question is no longer whether or not uh, it's going to happen, but when uh, it's going to happen, at least for, for Europe and the US, uh, given that it's already live uh, in few countries, uh, for example, the Bahamas, uh, Nigeria, Eastern Caribbean. Uh, so it's pretty important to, to look at this topic and to talk about that today. Excellent. And Josh, please. Yes, uh, well, pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm the Senior Director of the Geoeconomic Center at the Atlantic Council, but before that I worked at the IMF, and that's where my interest in CBDCs really developed. And that was early days where the fund was getting questions from countries in 2015 and 2016 for support of building CBDCs, and the IMF at that time had two people working on it, now they have 50, which just goes to the point of the growth of interest in CBDCs. We at the Atlantic Council run the Central Bank Digital Currency Tracking Project, which Ruth, you referenced the 114 countries, and we show that 60 of those countries are in a serious phase of development, meaning they've moved past research, they're spending taxpayer dollars in developing a CBDC, so they're serious from a central banking standpoint, and 18 of the G20 countries are past research. So some of the things that are said about CBDCs, not that many countries are doing it, smaller economies are doing it, that was true in the past, but I think what we show now is the rapid acceleration on both wholesale and retail, and it's so important for economies like the US, like the UK, to be standard setters in this space, even if we're a little later to the game. Just in the past year, what we've noted is that there's been a three times increase in interest in wholesale CBDC, and part of that, as we'll get into, is geopolitics and the way sanctions have been used against Russia. So there's so much happening in this space from the technological side, from the geopolitical side, uh, and there's just no room to be complacent about it. Excellent. And I think one could say that from an initial, maybe formal, sort of with China and some countries at a very large scale, looking at deploying it for particular geopolitical reasons. I think we now actually, due to the Ukraine crisis, have come much more into the must-do category. And I absolutely agree with you. I think the standard setting by large countries that have the more sophisticated legal regimes and the ability to help the country to become internationally recognized as a standard setter are, of course, the key drivers right now. I think it's also really important to remind ourselves of some of the particular examples you've mentioned around the drivers, retail CBDC in some countries is primarily to fight fraud, for example, or to increase financial inclusion. Maybe in the UK, CBDC is not so much financial inclusion, but maybe modernizing your money. So talking maybe with Gilbert, because you work with central banks directly, give us some examples of what you've encountered in that space and how it maybe also then is reflecting in the wholesale space. I think it's exactly what Josh mentioned. Central banks have moved on from the theory and, and the policy side into live implementations. And what they're really considering is, what does this mean for my domestic system? Uh, a lot of central banks have migrated to real-time payments, and that has usually taken a 15-year journey to get there. And they're looking at what's next, and what does this mean for commercial banks? What does this mean for consumers? What does it mean for, for businesses? And what they're finding is, through the technology of smart contracts and DLTs, they're able to create a, a, a new form of money that has uh, logic built in. And the central bank is not really interested in um, imposing things within the industry, but they want to facilitate things. And, and I guess the approach they're taking is, we'll provide the infrastructure and we'll provide the construct to create CBDCs and we'll let banks innovate and create a new ecosystem around that technology and the platform. So we're seeing really interesting use case around programmable logic, uh, allowing um, multi-party escrows, allowing uh, conditional payments, uh, allowing you know, rapid dispersion of, of funds, um, where the private sector takes that responsibility and creates the innovation. Um, and on the capital market side, it's linking tokenized money with tokenized uh, assets and having a, a rapid settlement um, move, moving from T plus two down to T plus zero is, is the utopia. And we're seeing that innovation come from the payments world into the capital markets world. Excellent. I mean, I remember when I did my PhD paper on a digital euro in 2017, the whole appeal for me as part of it was programmable money in order to make sure that AML legislation can be automatically enforced. So the ability to embed regulatory principles in the money itself. And I think once you start taking that to that next level that you just mentioned, you have almost unlimitless opportunities to create automation and also create liquidity and market movement where there maybe isn't any today if we think particularly about illiquid assets that haven't got any transparency and any ability to be traded. 
Now, Marion, also, I know that you looked a lot at the retail side initially. Share some of the views that you feel in the retail space and how that might also link to wholesale side because we always need the, the biggest settlement on that end as well. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. And, and actually, what I found fascinating is like, I, I can really see the value added of the wholesale CBDC, especially for what Gilbert mentioned, uh, in terms of T plus zero settlement side and so on. I think there is a real uh, value added to, to have a wholesale CBDC. Uh, what, what I found very interesting is like the research is much, much, much more advanced uh, in terms of retail CBDC. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we look at uh, w what is going on in terms of retail CBDC, we have around like 90% of central banks which are looking at CBDC. Uh, many of them are already piloting CBDC, but it's, it's also pretty interesting as well to see that central banks are looking at CBDC for different reasons. Uh, for example, as you were mentioning, Rolf, uh, China has been looking at CBDC uh, much, much earlier in 2014, but for very different reasons, uh, mainly financial inclusion, um, to decrease uh, cash uh, in the society, while uh, for, for the Eurozone, for the UK, for the US, uh, the reasons are very different, like it's more modernizing uh, payment uh, and less uh, financial inclusion. So, very, very different reasons. Uh, and in terms of time span, um, I, I would say as well that I found, what I found very interesting is like overall emerging economies are leading the race in terms of development. Uh, they are much more advanced than uh, advanced economies. Excellent. Yeah. And, and it's just, just from your experience as IMF and also now, I mean, you already mentioned that the geopolitical drivers have seriously increased in the last, I would say, years, very few years. Um, but it seems to be there's also sort of a competition between central banks, yeah. right? Maybe you want to expand a little yeah, bit. Yeah, we, we talk about it. We were talking about this. Some people call it CBDC FOMO, uh, which is, you know, well, what is this other central bank doing and why am I not doing it? That's not necessarily a bad thing. We sometimes refer to it pejoratively. Central banks use that language amongst themselves. It's okay for central banks to want to innovate, to want to experiment, to try to figure out where the future of money is going. For some economies, it will be useful. For other economies, it won't. It actually makes sense for central banks to be forward-leaning. Uh, they are the issuers of the sovereign fiat, and they should think of better ways to enhance monetary and fiscal policy if those tools are there. But there are some myths about CBDCs that I know this panel knows, and it's probably useful for the group to discuss. One is that CBDCs will disintermediate the commercial banking system. Every CBDC we study of the 114 is intermediated through the commercial banking system or other payment providers, even China's, for now. So I just put that out there because it's something you often hear in the CBDC conversation. Uh, we, the central banks have to use the distribution mechanisms of the commercial banks to get this to citizens. They are not gonna handle AML KYC. They are not gonna be customer interfaced. The second is that it's gonna cause a bank run. Of course, that's conceptually possible, and we can think about this in the SVB context of what just happened in the US. But that's why CBDCs are capped. The Eurozone will probably go with a 5,000 euro equivalent cap or something like that. It's specifically to address the bank run issue. And what we see in our research is that in practice, Gilbert, to your point, CBDCs operate differently than you might expect they would from the academic research. So every country that's issued a CBDC has seen their commercial banking liabilities increase not decrease. And we can think about why that is. My theory on that is that's because the countries don't have basically CBDC interfaces to accept the off-ramp. So you can get it from your government, but you can't spend it everywhere. So then you off-ramp it into commercial banking money or crypto or stablecoin, but something that's useful to you. But it's just to say there's so much we don't know about the field. It's so emerging, so developing. And the things we think we know about CBDC, we can learn a lot from Nigeria, from India, from China, from the Bahamas. Not all the lessons there apply to the Eurozone or the UK or the US, but some do and they're worth paying attention to. Excellent. And I mean, when I think about, I mean, my research at the time focused also on financial stability, which I thought is a really important piece because we think about global cross-border wholesale payments, We've seen things break down during the financial crisis. People didn't know where the liquidity was. They still don't know where it is. So there's, I think, one limitation around banks being able to manage liquidity real time because CBDCs will settle more or less real time. And it's quite different to the retail, you know, IOU structure because this would be central bank money that you actually have to have in your account to settle. So I think there's one sort of emerging challenge around adapting the banking industry to handle real time. And I agree with you, I think the retail aspect of being able to have a real-time bank run is something we should be mindful of, which is why there will be limits. 
But one point to make for this audience in particular around an earlier comment from the minister as well as later on from Gwyneth Nurse was around digital identity. If you are not able to identify individuals and for example attribute just one wallet to them as opposed to allowing people that are not identified to open multiple wallets, even if you have limits, you're then exposing yourself again to the AML risk and of course other risks. So maybe a few comments on that. Maybe Marion, have you seen that also in your research as a big risk factor, right? Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. And actually, as you mentioned, so we should be able, I mean, central bank should be able to, to, to put a name in order to, to monitor transactions. Uh, it's what China is doing very well. Uh, in Europe, it's probably much more tricky because people have a different kind of feeling um, towards anonymity. What, what I found fascinating is like, actually when the ECB uh, is interviewing, running some polls, questionnaire about what people are feeling about CBDC, the, the anonymity point uh, is pretty high actually on the agenda, but it's also probably a, <clears throat> a matter of how you ask the question. I mean, if you ask someone, do you care about anonymity? I think everyone here is going to say, yes, of course, we care about anonymity. But if we ask people if they have a, a smartphone, I think most of us uh, have a smartphone. If we ask people if they have Google Map, I think most of us have Google Map. Most of us have access to our email. So yes, we care about anonymity. Uh, we don't want to give all our data to, to Apple, to Visa, to MasterCard, to any private company. But at the same point, uh, convenience is always king when you look at uh, how people are behaving in the end. And maybe sticking a bit more with the wholesale side, I mean, Gilbert, you've been working with distributed ledger technology for a long time. Um, thinking about wholesale CBDC, I mean, some academics even years ago would say, our wholesale money is already digital. It's already a CBDC. We don't need anything else. Um, do you see many countries around the world truly looking at very new levels of distributed ledger technology with slightly different consensus algorithms versus a central database? for the wholesale point, because certainly the conversations we had in this country and in other countries have very much pointed to centralized databases that have nothing to do with DLT. What's your perspective on that and then the interoperability aspects as well? Uh, I mean, what we're seeing is um, that there is a need for a DLT with a lot of these implementations. Obviously, you can do it without, with, with an RTGS system, with the database, with the settlement system. But the features of DLT around smart contracts, security and privacy, enhance the infrastructure to a level that you couldn't before. Uh, so what we're seeing is a lot of implementations of interbank networks that, that are private permissioned. Uh, they all have all those features around privacy, security, and interoperability built in. Interconnectivity is brought by all the participants, so you're not forcing everyone to use the one technology or the one platform, but you're enhancing the whole uh, level of security for, for the infrastructure by using DLT. And then on the, on the privacy side, as, as Marion said, what we've also seen is the ability to um, share data securely on, on a DLT without giving up privacy. Mm -hmm. So you're enhancing even consumer and business protection by having a digital asset or tokenized money as a CBDC, whereas before, in, in terms of transactions and, and what, what, what was done in, in the old way, um, CBDCs and DLT make the whole thing more secure and enhance privacy to another level. So really, for wholesale in particular, in order to mobilize capital markets efficiently, we actually need DLT with everything hanging off it, which is a very interesting consideration. Josh, would you like to comment on now the more recent drive of wholesale, yeah. despite the geopolitics, because like the capital markets piece, are there countries that are truly looking at unlocking yeah. that potential? No, you read my mind. That's exactly what I wanted to talk about, because what we see in the research in this past year, as I mentioned, is this 3x increase in wholesale CBDC. Now, part of that is for all the reasons we're discussing. How can this improve cross-border payments efficiency, my current commercial bank to commercial bank system? But there's the geopolitics of it, and one driver is, are there technological solutions for me as a country to get around the dollar, specifically the way the dollar is used from the US Treasury perspective in sanctions enforcement? And wholesale CBDC potentially, underline the word potentially, because it's not there yet, could deliver to countries via their commercial banks 
way to transact and settle near instantly outside the dollar. So the way it works now where you have to go through the correspondent banking network, touch dollars even if you're not exchanging dollars, you wouldn't have to do that. And you see China's Enbridge project as an example of this, but not just China. You see Malaysia, you see South Africa, you see a range of countries who are asking themselves, are there systems that I can build in the future if I get on the wrong side of a US sanctions enforcement action that would then allow me to avoid dollar oversight. And that is a driver of interest in wholesale CBDC. It's one we should take very seriously from a US perspective, from a UK perspective, from a Eurozone perspective, because revitalizing the SWIFT system, revitalizing the correspondent banking system is gonna be something very important if we don't wanna see a splintering of these correspondent banking networks into the future. So are we in an arms race in, in essence? And do, do people have to pick sides eventually with the bigger players? Well, let me put it like this. If the dollar, the pound, the euro, and the yen could get their act together and coordinate on standards, on interoperability, no country could really avoid being part of that system. But we're not there yet. Everyone's moving at their own pace on retail and wholesale. And in the absence of that, you're seeing these regional wholesale CBDC networks develop. And I think just the elephant in the room, whenever we talk about any of these projects, a lot of it circles around the technical side, which by now people can technically do lots of cool things but it doesn't ever tackle the regulatory piece, right? Yeah. So if I want to do a wholesale transaction between the US and the UK, with CBDC, assuming that both countries have a CBDC working in the wholesale space, I need to be able to have fungibility between those currencies. And so today, if you hold US dollar, you have to hold it at the US bank that's eligible for an account at the Fed. You can't hold US dollar here unless it's paper money, which of course is not what we're talking about at all. And in future, to allow for these ownership changes at least, not necessarily legal ownership changes, but beneficial ownership changes, we need an agreement, and that's exactly the point, Josh, between those larger players to work together to allow us to exchange our currencies so that we don't get squeezed out by trade corridors that are going to increase over time with other people's currencies that may not be operating according to the same, I guess, legal and ethical principles as well, which is a really important point to take home in my view. But just on a final note, given we only have three minutes left, I don't know why we could debate this for 25 minutes, <laughs> we could debate this for 15 hours. Um, on the capital market side, I think the opportunity to unlock illiquid markets and provide that cash lag and allow more access for anybody to invest, which today is very restricted and some assets you just can't invest in because you would have to buy in the millions as opposed to the fractional element. Maybe Gilbert, if you want to give us more, some more examples of how you've been playing around with technological and legal ideas in that space. I think, yeah, we saw this from the London Stock Exchange yesterday. They, they, want, they want to remove the difference between private equity and public equity and remove the barriers to investors and, and to, on, the, on the buy side and the sell side to participants. So what we see is unlocking a lot of private equity that was previously closed, previously closed. And what you can do with the technology is, is you know, create velocity and, and allow it to roam. So you're not limiting it to a jurisdiction, you're not lim limiting it to an exchange. You can run this and transact and buy this anywhere in the world. So we're seeing that, that decomposition of financial services because it's, it's blurring the lines between all the different types of assets. And it's, in a way, it's decentralizing what used to be very centralized, mm. something I'm tackling in my next book, which comes out next month. But I think we ended up in a world that is too centralized. And now looking at how technology can help us to open up the market and decentralize more with distributed ledger, smart programmability, and the regulatory co coherence between the big players is really what we're looking at at this point. Excellent. Any last comments from Marion or Josh? Please. Oh, uh, well, I just uh, build on what was being said. CBDCs are an opportunity. They're an opportunity for the public sector. They're also an opportunity for the private sector. I, I think, and I say this as an American being in the UK, the UK gets that more than we do in the US right now. I see a lot more coordination between the public and private sector on this issue than I see back in the US. And the research shows, and the message I would just leave everyone is that this can really help build a healthy digital asset ecosystem if done right. It can also go very badly if done wrong, and we should not ignore those risks. Uh, but it's important to be innovative. It's important to think of public-private sector collaboration in this space. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to echo what uh, Josh uh, just mentioned. I think it's a real opportunity that solves like um, I mean, big issue that we have, both on the wholesale side with settlement, 
clearing and, and so on, and, and both on the retail space. Um, and we shouldn't forget that cash uh, in circulation has been declining, cash as a mean of payment has been declining. Mm. Um, it's a long-term trend which has been accelerated by the COVID pandemic. And it's also one way actually to look at the digital cash of the 21st century. Um, and and th there is a real use case for, for retail CBDC. Excellent. So CBDC is really the necessary cash leg to mobilize capital markets of the 21st century. I think that's a good way of closing it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much to Marion, Gilbert, and Josh for joining me.